very early in my career as a psychologist, when I was an undergrad, in fact, I got interested in anything a little bit weird, the weird side of psychology, like anything to do with false memories or believing in magic and ghosts and psychic powers and Bigfoot and stuff like that. I was into that. And that's what led me to my career in the psychology of conspiracy theories. And in those early days when I was getting interested in weird psychology, I was very influenced by books about science and skepticism, not least of which Flim Flam by James Randi. And so I want to join everybody here in saluting Randy. So with my talk today, I want to very quickly run through a few aspects of our psychology that can conspire, so to speak, to make us susceptible to conspiracy theories. And I'd like to start with a little thought experiment. So I'd like you to imagine that it's the mid-1960s, and you work for NASA. And more specifically, you work for the Apollo missions, part of the crew who've been tasked with putting humans on the moon before the end of the decade. Now, President Kennedy, he famously said that America would put men on the moon before the end of the decade, not because it was easy, but because it was hard. But I want you to imagine that it turns out it's really hard. It's not going very well. And bear in mind that this is during the Cold War. The Cold War is heating up. The space race is reaching a climax. The Soviets have already put the first satellite in space. They put the first human in orbit. And it looks like now they're going to put the first people on the moon as well. So the pressure is on. This does not look good. It looks like the Soviets are going to beat America to the moon as well. And so now imagine that your boss comes to you and says, there's a change of plan. It turns out we're not going to be able to make it to the moon, so we're going to fake it instead. We're going to fake the moon landing. We've already booked the studio. It's in Arizona. We've got all the prop moon rocks. We've labeled them A, B, and C. We've got Stanley Kubrick has signed on to direct. <laughs> Nobody is ever going to know that we've faked the moon landing. So I want you to imagine yourself in this situation and ask yourself, would you have gone along with it? Would you have been part of a conspiracy to fake the moon landing? Should we do a show of hands? Is anybody? So that's what I expected. There are a few people willing to admit it. If somebody nearby you raised their hand, you might want to watch your back. But, <laughs> but most people said no, probably not. I would not fake the moon landing. And so I think my clicker is not working. And so I based, whoops, no, it is. Conspiracy. What? All right, I'll give it a minute. So I based this thought experiment on a study um, by colleagues of mine, Karen Douglas and Robbie Sutton. And this is what they did, basically. They got a bunch of college students and they asked them this question. If you had found yourself in these circumstances, would you have faked the moon landing? And for good measure, they also asked, would you have killed Princess Diana? Would you have faked climate change data? Would you have manufactured the AIDS virus? And would you have covered up the existence of aliens? And reassuringly, most of the college students who they asked said, no, I wouldn't dream of it. On a scale of one being definitely not to seven being absolutely, I would do all these conspiracies, I wish I could, the average was about a two, I think. The average score was about a two. So most people said they wouldn't dream of it. But there were a few people who said they were maybe willing, under the circumstances, to take part in all these conspiracies. And the interesting thing about these people is that the people who said they were maybe more willing to take part in the conspiracies, they were the same people who said, I think these conspiracy theories are true. I think the moon landing really was faked. I think Princess Diana was killed by a conspiracy, and so on. And so what the authors argue is that this reflects a psychological bias called the projection bias. And Sigmund Freud, he famously talked about projection as a psychological tendency, but Freud talked about projection as this kind of illicit thing where we project our socially undesirable tendencies onto somebody else. And we say, I am a perfectly fine human being, everybody else is terrible. And we're projecting outwards. That's not what psychologists think of projection anymore. We, we understand projection as a very general psychological bias, whereby to understand anything that happens in the world, to understand other people's behavior, we imagine ourselves in their circumstances. And this is a very useful thing to predict other people's behavior. If we see somebody raise a glass of water to their face, we have to understand what are they probably going to do next. And we think, if I were doing this, I would probably take a sip of this water. I would not take a bite out of the glass or something crazy like that. And so this person who I'm watching, that's probably what they're going to do. They're going to take a sip. And so this helps us understand the world. But in some cases, like in this experiment, we are projecting outwards our, our Machiavellian traits, our 
desire, our willingness to take part in conspiracies. And if you're the kind of person who thinks, I would probably conspire given the opportunity, then you project that out and you imagine that the world is full of potential conspirators. Everybody else probably would as well. And if you live in a world full of potential conspirators, then it becomes more likely that historically somebody did that, that these conspiracy theories are true, that somebody did fake the moon landing. And so this projection bias, this is the first inclination that psychology plays a role in people's acceptance of conspiracy theories. It's not all to do with the facts, it's to do with our psychological understanding of the world as well. And so for the next psychological tendency, I'd like to show you a short video. Some of you may have seen this before. If you haven't, please just watch along and think about what you see happening. I should say, first of all, that this is from an experiment, a classic experiment in social psychology from the 1940s. In the original study, there was no music. I've added this for dramatic effect. Um, <laughs> but the point of this study is we see this rudimentary video of these shapes moving around the screen. And if most of you are like the participants in the original study, you will have seen not just an arbitrary display of shapes moving around a screen, but you will have understood this in terms of a story, a story involving characters characters acting out their motivations and their beliefs and their desires. And so many people, when they see this, they see it as a story about like a jilted lover, this big triangle hassling the other two shapes and chasing them around. Some people see it as a story about children in a school playground fighting. Um, some people see it as a story about a witch enticing children into her house. There are many different stories that people see, but the point is that only one participant in the original study described this purely in geometric terms as a video of, like, a circle moves inside a rectangle and things like that. Everybody else understood it as a story about people, characters. And so this study, it shows how little it takes to engage that aspect of our psychology, the aspect that leads us to understand the world in terms of motives and desires. And I want to be clear that I'm not saying it's wrong of us to see this video as a story about characters. The researchers designed it this way. They had this in mind, and they painstakingly animated this video. It was the 1940s, so they had to cut these shapes out of cardboard and frame by frame, move them around, and they deliberately made it look like this chase scene. And they talk about that in their, in their paper. But the point is, it doesn't take much to engage this aspect of our brain, just a few shapes moving around the screen. And so, then there's another study by Karen Douglas It was published last year where they used this video. They showed participants the same video I just showed you without the dramatic music, I assume. Um, and then instead of asking the participants to describe what they saw happening, they used a set of scales and they had participants rate the shapes on these scales. And the questions referred to how conscious were these shapes on a scale of one to seven? How alive were they? How motivated were they? And questions like that. And so the higher participants rated the shapes, the stronger their tendency to see the world in these terms, in terms of motives and intent. And in addition to that, the researchers asked participants about conspiracy theories. How much do you believe these various conspiracy theories? Again, on scales of like one to seven. Seven being, I think this is true. One being, I don't think this is true. And they find that those two scores were correlated. So the more conscious and motivated 
participants saw these shapes as, the more likely they were to believe conspiracy theories. So this leads me to a study that I did, looking at this same tendency, but from quite a different angle. Instead of using that video that Karen Douglas used, what we did was we used a set of ambiguous sentences, sentences that could be understood as uh, describing something that happened on purpose, or that could be describing something that happened by accident. And so these are some examples of the sentences we used. Uh, she kicked the dog. When you read that, you might imagine somebody coming home angry and distracted, and the dog gets in her way, and so she kicks it out of the way. Or you might imagine somebody who's carrying a pile of laundry and can't see the dog and trips over the dog by accident. And similarly, he set the house on fire. Maybe you imagine somebody, an arsonist, laughing gleefully as he sets fire to a house. Or maybe you imagine somebody falling asleep with a lit cigarette and accidentally burning down the house. And so the point is, these are ambiguous. And we did a similar procedure to what Karen Douglas did to quantify this bias. We just added up the number of sentences that people in, uh, interpreted as intentional. And that number, the number of intentional sentences, again correlated with belief in conspiracy theories. The more of these sentences that somebody understood as intentional, the more they tended to believe conspiracy theories. And so what I think this represents is an intentionality bias. We all have this bias to understand the world in terms of intent. And when we come across ambiguous events that might have been accidental or might have been done on purpose, we are biased, we're inclined towards thinking that probably happened on purpose. And so why does this relate to conspiracy theories? Well, I think because conspiracy theories paint a world in which everything happens on purpose. Nothing happens by accident. Everything was controlled and planned and executed by the conspirators. And so to give a real-world example, think about the Malaysian Airlines flight MH370 that disappeared a few years ago. One way of understanding this would be it was probably an accident. It was a malfunction or pilot error, accidental, something like that. Or we could understand it as something that happened intentionally. Somebody planned this. It was a terrorist action, or the pilot did it on purpose, or there was a larger government conspiracy behind it. And so to the extent that we are in indulging in our intentionality bias, or to put it another way, to the extent that we're failing to override our intentionality bias, we're going to be more receptive to these kind of conspiracy theories. So a third bias that's relevant here is something called the proportionality bias. And that's a fancy way of saying, when something big happens, we expect that something big probably caused it. Or on the other hand, when something small happens, we assume that it has a small explanation. And so to stick with the example of aviation disasters, we could think about flight TWA-800, the plane which exploded over Long Island, New York in the 90s, um, and immediately provoked conspiracy theories, which are still popular to this day. The idea that maybe this was shot down. Some people talked about maybe seeing a missile being launched at this plane. Maybe it was some kind of government operation, or maybe at least the government has covered up what they know about this event. So that's a fairly big event. The plane was destroyed. Everybody on board was killed. This was a tragic, shocking, fairly momentous event. We could compare that with a similar kind of event, but which had a smaller outcome, which had a, a smaller magnitude. For example, the US Airways flight, which crash-landed on the Hudson a few years ago. Uh, and there was a film made about this, Sully. The pilot successfully managed to land this plane on the Hudson River. Nobody was seriously harmed. Everybody made it out alive. And there have been barely any conspiracy theories about this event, either at the time or since. People are satisfied with the small, mundane explanation that this was a bird strike. A bird flew into the engine of the plane, causing a malfunction, and they had to ditch into the river. And so the big event, it elicits this big explanation. This was a grand conspiracy, whereas the small event, we seem to be more satisfied with a small explanation. And so this has been tested in controlled psychological studies. The general uh, setup of the experiments is that the researchers create fake news stories, a fictitious news event uh, in which the magnitude of the outcome is manipulated. So for some participants, they read a story about a president of a fictitious country um, being assassinated and dying. Other participants read about the same fictitious president of the same fictitious country. There was an assassination attempt, but miraculously, the president survived. And so we have a big event and a small event. When the consequences are big, the president dies. People are more receptive to conspiracy theories. When the event is small, the president survives. People reject the conspiracy theories. <laughs> 
And so there's a perfect real-life example of this as well, of course, which is the Kennedy assassination, which has provoked some of the most enduring and popular conspiracy theories of the 20th and 21st century. Um, basically, from the moment of the assassination, there were surveys within a few days, within a week of the assassination. And at that time, something like eight or nine out of 10 Americans thought there was more to this. This was not a lone gunman. There was a conspiracy behind this. Um, and that is true to this day. More than half of Americans think there was a conspiracy behind the assassination of President Kennedy. And it seems understandable from the point of view of this proportionality bias. This was a huge, momentous, shocking event. It couldn't possibly be explained by something as small and simple as a lone gunman, Lee Harvey Oswald, some guy who most people had never heard of before, just got out of bed one day and decided to change the course of history. According to our proportionality bias, this is not an intuitively satisfying explanation. And so we might become more receptive to bigger explanations explanations which posit a grand conspiracy, that people knew about this in advance, there were more people involved, and it's still being covered up. And we could compare that to another similar event, but which had a different kind of an outcome, which had a smaller outcome, like the attempted assassination of Ronald Reagan in the 1980s. Reagan was shot, he came very close to dying, but the doctors managed to save his life, and he survived. And there have been barely any conspiracy theories about this assassination attempt, either at the time or subsequently. This was a much smaller event. The consequences were of smaller magnitude. And so people seem to be more satisfied with the smaller explanation. They don't need to go looking for a bigger explanation about a conspiracy because this was such a small event. And so the last aspect of our psychology I want to talk about is perhaps the most fundamental ability that we have, our ability to recognize patterns in the world, to spot patterns and to extract meaning. And so this is a visual illusion. This is one of my favorite visual illusions because I think this looks like some kind of spooky symbol that could be like the seal of a secret society or something. Um, this is a famous illusion. It's called the Knitze Triangle. And as you look at this, you will see it's composed of two overlapping triangles. One doesn't have an outline. The other one has a black outline. And one of the triangles is sitting on top of these three circles. And the most remarkable thing about this illusion, I think, is that the white triangle, the one that doesn't have an outline, the one that's sitting on top, it seems to be like whiter than white. It seems to pop out. It seems to be a different shade of white to the background. And it doesn't necessarily work that well on screens like this, but when you see it in a nice printed version on a piece of paper, this really pops out at you. This white triangle on top seems to be whiter than the rest of it. And of course, none of this is true. None of that exists. These, there are no triangles there. There are no circles. There are just these incomplete parts. There's these three acute angles that seem to form one of the triangles. And there's these three incomplete circles that look like Pac-Man sort of things. None of the complete shapes are there. Your brain is filling in the details. It's connecting the dots. It's saying this looks like it should be these complete shapes, and they're sort of being overlapped. And it fills in the details behind the scenes. And that's why the triangle on top looks whiter than white, because your brain is telling you this is a real thing. This exists. It is there. But it doesn't. And there is no different shade of white here. That triangle on top is exactly the same shade as the background. There is no difference here. This is all in your mind. And so, in the real world, when we're not looking at visual illusions which have been designed to trick us, we often come across these ambiguous visual arrangements, and we have to go looking for the meaning there. We have to think, is there a pattern here? Can I spot the meaning? And um, I've taken a couple of pictures from a psychological study where participants were presented with these noisy visual arrays. There was some visual static, maybe there's a pattern hidden in there. And so, as you look at this one, you can probably see a shape there. It looks like the planet Saturn or a UFO or something like that. There's a shape in there. There's a pattern. This is another one from the same experiment. This is one of these noisy visual arrays. And as you look at this, you might see a pattern. A lot of people say they see like a human figure or a face in here or something like that. But in actual fact, there's nothing there. This is purely random visual static. If you see a pattern, it's because your brain is tricking you. Your brain is connecting the dots connecting them up into something that makes sense, but something which is not actually there. And so this is from a study by Jennifer Whitson and Adam Galinsky from 2008. They looked at various forms of 
seeing illusory patterns like this. They looked at the kind of visual patterns that I showed you in those two pictures. They also looked at superstitions, so thinking that one event was somehow spookily related to a particular outcome. They looked at seeing trends in the stock market, thinking that a raise in price or decline in price was associated with some event that came before that. And crucially for us, they also looked at conspiracies, the idea that there was some kind of conspiracy to cause a particular outcome. And what they found is that for all of these different forms of thinking, these different kinds of tasks, people were more likely to see patterns under certain circumstances, when people were made to feel like they lacked control, that they didn't have control over their own circumstances, they were more likely to see visual patterns in the kind of images I showed you a, minute, a moment ago. They were more likely to endorse superstitious claims. They were more likely to see illusory correlations in stock market data. And they were more likely to endorse conspiracy theories. They were more likely to think that somebody had plotted to make something happen when they were made to feel a lack of control. And so the authors argue that all these different forms of thinking, they represent the same underlying tendency, the, the ceaseless search for patterns and for meanings. We're constantly, meaning, we're, all, we're constantly trying to understand the world to take in ambiguous data and turn it into something that makes sense. So whether we're looking at ambiguous visual images or stock market data or claims about conspiracy theories, these are all representations of our search to understand the world, to spot the patterns that are there. And so, to give you a real-world real example of this, I want to talk about one of my favorite conspiracy theories, conspiracy ideas, which some of you may have heard of, but it's one of the more obscure conspiracy theories to do with the Kennedy assassination. So, this is a frame from the Zapruder film, which is very famous, many of you will have seen. Uh, this is a frame from just after the, the Kennedy's motorcade has emerged from behind this street sign. It was momentarily out of view. And this is kind of the first moment that it becomes clear something is wrong. Kennedy's clutching his throat in this unnatural way. Uh, the first bullet that hit him has struck. And we all know what happens next, the gruesome headshot. Um, but at this moment, there's something else here which seems a little bit odd. Apart from Kennedy clutching his throat like this, there's another odd object, which is this umbrella right here. I'll point out over here, too. It looks like this umbrella in front of the street sign, half hidden. We can't see the person who's holding it, but somebody has an open umbrella here. And people noticed this, and they said, that doesn't really make sense. It was raining earlier that morning in Dallas, but now it's a bright, sunny day. It was sort of breezy. It wasn't umbrella weather. Nobody else along the motorcade route had an open umbrella. Just this one person who happens to be right next to Kennedy almost at the moment of his assassination. How can we explain this? And this is not an illusion. This was a real thing that was really there. There are other pictures from the scene of this guy holding this umbrella. Here's one. He's circled there. Uh, here's another. You can see him standing there. And even more intriguingly, eyewitnesses who saw this guy there, they said he wasn't just holding up this umbrella, but he was acting kind of strangely with it. He was hoisting it up and down and twirling it around a little bit in a conspicuous way. And he wasn't interviewed by the police at the time. He kind of left the scene, and nobody spoke to him, and he was lost to history for many years. So conspiracy theorists noticed this. They said, what is this out-of-place umbrella doing here right next to Kennedy at the moment of his assassination? This must be connected. There must be a pattern here. And so some people thought, <laughs> maybe, maybe he's the assassin. Maybe hiding in plain sight. This is the guy who assassinated Kennedy. Maybe inside his umbrella there was some kind of projectile firing mechanism. Maybe this is the guy who shot Kennedy. And you know, that's one hypothesis, maybe. We wouldn't have known, except that the government tracked down this guy. They tracked down this umbrella man in the 1970s when they were reinvestigating the assassination. They found this guy. They put an advert in newspapers saying, if anybody knows who this guy with this umbrella is, let us know. And a friend of his did, and he went in front of this government investigation. He was uh, an insurance salesman who lived in Dallas at the time of the assassination called Louis Stephen Witt. Um, Remarkably, this was about 15 years after the assassination, and he still had the same umbrella. Things were made to last back then. You can see it on the table in front of him. That is the very same umbrella. And so, of course, the first thing the government did was they said, let us take a look at this umbrella, let us open it up, look for a gun in there. And it like, splayed itself inside out like this obligingly. And uh, the chairman of the committee said, I guess there's no gun in it. He seemed kind of disappointed by this. But, and so they said, well, what, why, why did you have this umbrella? What were you doing there? 
And Louis Stephen Witt, he explained. And it turned out this, he was there. He was doing something intentionally, but it was far more obscure than anybody could have possibly guessed. He said this was a heckle, basically. He knew that the black umbrella was a sore spot for the Kennedy family because JFK's dad, Joseph Kennedy, had been ambassador to Britain in the run-up to World War II. The British Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain, was criticized for his policy of appeasement towards the Nazis. And Chamberlain was also noted for carrying around a black umbrella. And so by extension, this black umbrella became a sore spot for the Kennedy family. Louis Stephen Witt, he said, oh, the President Kennedy's coming through town. I have a black umbrella. I don't really like Kennedy. I'm going to go and heckle him. I'm going to wave this umbrella around. That's going to take him off a little bit. And so he did, and unfortunately for Louis Stephen Witt, um, Kennedy got assassinated at basically the moment that he was passing by Louis Stephen Witt. Uh, he said in his testimony, if there was a Guinness World Record for being in the wrong place at the wrong time doing the wrong thing, he would have won it and there wouldn't have even have been a close runner-up. <laughs> so, I, I came across a quote. I want to finish by considering this quote, um, describing this umbrella man. This is a quote from the writer John Updike, which he, he wrote this in 1967 in a Talk of the Town piece for The New Yorker, uh, when the first book had come out talking about this umbrella man. It still wasn't known who he was or what he was doing. John Updike said, this umbrella man, our search to understand this, he said, it shows how perilously empiricism verges on magic. And what he was saying is we have these two facts here. We have this open umbrella, we have this assassinated president, and of course, we want to see what is the meaning here. Are these things connected? How can we explain this? But those facts don't exist in isolation. Those facts require somebody to interpret them and to explain them. That's the hard part. That's up to us. And for some people, relying on their psychological biases towards seeing intentionality, towards proportionality, towards finding patterns, they're going to be receptive to conspiracy theories. But this is much more general than that. We all rely on these biases pretty much all the time to understand the world around us. It just so happens, I think, that conspiracy theories are particularly conspicuous. They demonstrate these biases in stark relief, whereas in most of our daily life, they just slip by unnoticed. So, thank you for listening.